Hi, and welcome to the show. This will be the last regular show of the season, and we're going to have a special one-hour show today. I don't know how to introduce this man that I have on the show today. I really don't. I've been trying to think of the words. The, he's written five books. There are many books about him, television shows, documentaries. He's uh, simply described as guardian enforcer for the Gambino crime family. And the Gambino crime family is pretty much the family of which most mob movies, uh, The Godfather, most of them, uh, uh, is about, about the Gambino crime family. But if I had to think of one way to introduce this man, it would be this. And I, I'm not quoting, this is my own quote. If you took all the characters from The Sopranos, uh, uh, The Goodfellas, The Godfather movies, Bronx Tale, uh, I don't care what series you pick, what m movie you pick. You take all those characters, De Niro, Pacino, uh, Chaz Palminteri, throw them into a blender, turn that blender on and pour that blender into a glass, <clears throat> and that glass is drawn a light. That glass is full of him, because he is the embodiment of every character that you've ever seen on any mob show documented. John, welcome aboard. Thanks for driving Thank up here from John. New Jersey. Thank you. I appreciate it. And you live in Audubon, New Jersey. Yeah, yeah, now I do, yeah. That's a, so was that named after the, the original Audubon, like James Audubon? The, the I don't know. Guy? You know what? I, I, I never, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, John, I want to start right out of the blocks with your testimony in the Gotti trial, which all of us in this room <clears throat> would, have, would have watched in real time. How many trials did you testify in? Just two. You just defied in two, and in both of them, there was either an acquittal or a hung jury, am I correct? No, no. One was a conviction, the other one was an acquittal. An acquittal. And well, I, a hung jury, not an acquittal. A hung jury? Yeah, a hung jury. <clears throat> and I read that when the jurors were interviewed, they said, well, we didn't find his testimony credible, even though the government, when they went to speak at your sentencing, said he was credible, he was honest, <clears throat> and he was candid. I want to ask you. Do you think it was your testimony that was not credible or somebody got to the jury? Well, no, I don't think anybody got to the jury. Really? Yeah, I, I don't believe that. <laughs> what I believe is Gotti's attorney said uh, their, whole, their whole case was based on blaming me and the father for doing all these crimes, that it had nothing to do with the son. And the jury believed I was way too violent. This is his attorney's version. He believed I was way too violent for the son who's not violent at all to be able to control me. So they didn't believe that he was intelligent enough to be able to control me, which they were right. I mean, honestly, the, the messages and, and, and the crimes were coming through the father and the son was the conduit to me. So, you know, it, it, they do have a point and his attorney made, uh, uh, actually did that interview in Forbes and said that uh, they just believe I was just way too violent for most of the guys in the street. Um, John, let me, let my, me just uh, I just want to introduce you, Rob. My co-host today and the person responsible for getting this interview going is my dear friend, Rob Baldacci. I promise, Rob, I'm not going to chime in every five seconds today. And the message, if he says there he passed the catch-up, that means I'm talking too much. Rob, You're talking too much. <laughs> oh, no, I love you. I love you. Uh, John, first of all, thank you for coming up to Maine. Thank you. Rob. It's a real pleasure to get to meet Appreciate you and, and uh, for us to be able to have this exchange. Talk a little bit about growing up in Queens, New York, and how you ended up living the life you did for so many years. Uh, a very violent life, uh, working with the mafia, working with one of the five uh, crime families, organized crime families in New York. But you, you know, talk about your father a little bit, the neighborhood, and, uh, and how you ended up a life of, in a life of crime. Well, my father grew up in the Lansing Rivington Street in, in the Low East Side of Manhattan. Right. He was known as the hub for the mob. And uh, he was friends with guys like Vito <coughs> Genovese. They were from those areas. Yep. Uh, Lucky Luciano's <coughs> cousin, Blackie, who was a North Jersey guy, but uh, had mm. business in the city uh, as kids with my father in the North Jersey. Uh, so he was around these gangsters and he introduced me to these gangsters as a kid. So I was exposed to him at three and four years old. I, I was with some famous gangsters. and. Uh, he was an outskirt guy, he was a gambler, he was a street guy. We come from Albania, which was a closed-in country, it was a communist country. Uh, you didn't, a lot of people didn't understand the, uh, the culture of Albanians and the suppression from the Ottoman days. So my father wanted me to be able to protect myself on the street. And he was very, he didn't care about education. He dropped out of school in the third grade. He had a mentality of, you know, work on the street, hustle on the street. Uh, 
and uh, be a fighter, to be able to, you know, not get bullied in a, in a, in a violent world that he grew up in. Yep. His intentions were good, but uh, what he wanted from me and what I did is I didn't stay on the outskirts of the mob like he did. I didn't stay just friendly. I wanted to be the guy running things. Yeah. So uh, I developed, be because of what he taught me, to be violent. Uh, he was a fighter, he was a boxer. My uncles were boxers. They were all gamblers and I'd seen violence in the house, in the street, from where we come from. And I became very violent and became a fighter. What was it about these mob guys that said, that's, that's what I want to be? That's what I want to be. <laughs> like everybody, money. scratch. Yeah. You know, you're coming from a communist country that you know, nobody <clears throat> has money. Right. Uh, you know, my family's all broke. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's other neighbors surrounding my neighborhood. I'm from Jamaica Avenue. That you've seen some big money guys. And then I'd go to card games down in, in the you know, South Bronx, uh, behind a, an abandoned building in a garage underneath the parking garage was behind that. That uh, guys like uh, Al Greco and a and, uh, very tough, famous guy that ended up getting life for murders were friends with my father and, and Blackie and Handsome Jack. And these guys were some of the guys from the New Jersey crews too. So I'm, I'm with these guys. They're driving beautiful cars. Back those days, everybody had caddies and convertibles and Lincolns. It wasn't so much the Mercedes back in those days. And, uh, you know, I seen money, I seen suits, I seen power. You know, you, as a kid, I, I hear people say, well, as a kid, you don't know. Yeah, you do know. You, you, you're around stuff and you see who has power just by the way they move around. And where's this money coming from, John? Drugs and what else? Where's the income coming from? Well, my uncle was a, a you know, he was a very good card player. He was, the, he was a dealer, my uncle Harry. And uh, he would run those three card Monty games in the Bronx. And he used to brag about. Joe, How much money are we talking in a night? He made more money than Reggie Jackson. Whatever Reggie Jackson's salary was, my uncle as a kid used to brag that he, you know, when we were kids, he'd brag that he's making more money than Reggie Jackson. So that's just his cut. So, you know, that's from a, a card game. That's not from anything else. He listed gambling, uh, loan shark in the drug business. So, you know, I'm a kid and I'm watching these guys and I'm saying, you know, you're seeing this kind of money going through hands and, you know, I'd be eating ice cream in the back room and they'd give me a hundred dollars back. You know, you're talking about 50 years ago. Right, right. You know, you, you get a hundred. My father used to say, don't take the money. Meanwhile, we wanted to tell my father, shut the, can I curse? No, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to tell my father, shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, but so the guys, you know, on a bad day, they give us 20. So me and yeah. my brother, we wanted to be there all the time. John, what, what blows my mind is we've had this conversation for the last half hour we've been waiting for the studio to be set up. And you talk about being a great baseball player in high school. You get a, you get a baseball scholarship. I mean, so you, 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 you get away being this all-American kid, uh, baseball, you know, the all-American sport, to, to you know, being an enforcer for the, the, the toughest crime family. But what I want to ask you is how much money in a year, when you were like in your 20s and 30s, how much money would you be making in a year? It's a good, great question. You know, we had an organization of guys, and one of, you know, I, I want a condolence actually for Stevie Newell, who's one of my guys that we had a falling out at one time, I ended up shooting him. And then we became friendly again years later, and. Uh, you shot him and then you became friends again? Well, he worked with me, and you know, the street, listen, the street is a funny spot, because everything that you do is about your image. And if your right. image gets, you know, tainted a little bit, Tarnished. so it's, you know, yeah. you can't let anybody talk to you a certain way, especially if you're going to be live off your name. You know, I, I used to say my, my face is my wallet. So if I let anybody take advantage of me a little bit and other people seeing that, that earns, that ruins my earning capacity. So your face is your out, wallet. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I never wore a mask. Never did a robbery with a mask. And uh, the people say, why? I said, I wanted them to know it was me. I wanted them to fear me. And uh, I wanted to know that I didn't have to kill him to rob him. But if they came back, I would kill him. So, you know, I was secure with that, secure with the way I handled myself on the street. And I ended up shooting Stevie. And Stevie made a statement about money. To get back to your question is, uh, he said I was the smallest guy in John's organization. I made 15000 a month back in those days. So uh, we made millions. You know, we, we had big money. I, I bought a lot of properties and, and things like that. Talk a little bit about that, some of your properties, yeah. just just to add credence to... Uh... You know, people, you know, when you're talking about property, I own the property, it's a $10 million estate. I had the lakes on it and built-in pools and an outdoor boxing ring, a pavilion and three homes and a driveway to seven blocks. I blacktopped it, uh, paved it. It was probably just that was, you know, a quarter of a million dollars to blacktop the roadways. 
And then I had properties like, uh, I can give you addresses, like a good memory. I know 1505 you can. Aspen Drive, Plainsboro, uh, 2192 uh, Ash Court, uh, <laughs> South Jersey, uh, uh, South Brunswick. Had 78 Brick Road, Cherry Hill, 805 West Hillsborough in Florida. <laughs> so you're mo- Monopoly, you're playing it. real Monopoly. Yeah, 295 Greenwich Court, Manhattan. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> I bought buildings and houses, and you know, and, and I got a good memory, so I can yeah. spit out addresses like crazy. And, yeah, boardwalk you know, and 97, 44, 91st Street. I had two units there in Ozone Park. So you know, when guys are questioning sometimes the amount of money we made, I can just yeah. spit these buildings and properties out and. You know, I owned nightclubs. I had five nightclubs. You I had after nightclubs? Hours. What, what kind of night, nightclubs? I, I owned uh, a place Discotech called Discotheque kind of thing? Uh, country music. I country owned music. Stampedes in Florida, American Cowboy 1 and 2. I owned Moet's Mirage. I owned uh, Illegal After Hours. So, you know, I had a ton of businesses. I owned uh, clothing stores on my own, it was called, in Cherry Hill at the candy store. Uh, Colony Cherry Corner. Hill, New Jersey. Yeah. Cherry Hill Park. Remember? So, yeah. you know, I had, I, I wasn't the typical also. I bought businesses and I got involved in illegal and legal. So my illegal money went into my legal. And that's how the government came after me. They said that I was cleaning my money through my John, companies. in the early 90s, you were doing international drug dealing in 10 different countries, dealing with 10 cartels, and you were bringing in the family essentially over a million dollars in a month. And this is back, way back. So these cartels, are you telling me that you also worked with like, I mean, the Colombian cartel and the Mexican cartels? Are you dealing with, with the high up guys, like the, the Chapo kind of guys? Well, you know, there's the Flores brothers that actually testified against Chapos. Those guys did time with me. So uh, people that don't, you know, the, the, the reach we have. I had, you know, friends like that. My friend Nelson, he'll be coming out pretty soon. Uh, and he'd be doing some shows with me. He's one of the bosses over the years from El Salvador, MS-13, to, to uh, the Mexican Mafia. So these are personal friends of mine. These are guys I know. I'm, I went on a run. I was with the cartel in Colombia. They hid me. And uh, for people that... They hid you? They hid me. I, I, mean, they, I went they, on a they, run. They, they, they took yeah, care of me. They took care of me, yeah. And, you know, for people that want to look at uh, statements by guys like Ronnie Juan Truccio, who was a captain of the Gambino family, his opening statement when he was talking against me was uh, that I'm, the, uh, I'm, I'm running the drug industry for the Gaudis and with the Gaudis. He said it like 15 times on his opening statement. Right. So that's a captain in the Gambino family t- doing the talking against me. So, you know, when people are questioning what's accurate, what isn't, they could go get the documents in the Florida case and see what he had to say. Uh, called me a, a loose cannon and a killer and, you know, some other uh, words against me. But these are their statements, not mine. Could we just roll it back just a little bit, uh, John, in terms of uh, your, how did you end up working for John Gotti and the Gambino crime family? Uh, how did that happen? Uh, Fat Andy Ruggiano was uh, mm-hmm. a captain in our neighborhood. He was uh, made by Murder, Inc. and Albert Anastasia. He was the grandfather figure to me. I grew up in his house, around his family, around his sons, Albert and Anthony. Uh, I was very close at, at that time with Albert more than Anthony. Anthony does is involved in this genre a little bit with me. Um, and Albert was my baseball coach. We would box up at Lost Battalion Hall. We were all fighters. Uh, I did Jerry Cooney's show. People that don't know who he is, he fought Larry Holmes, very right. famous fight. Yep. So me and Jerry did a show on his radio show about, you know, when we were boxing at, at Lost Battalion Hall in those days. And then some of this stuff in this genre. But... Uh, you know, I work for them. I grew up with them. I work for them. And uh, later on, Fat Andy ends up getting a, a 18 or 22 year bid. And Gotti Sr. ends up taking over the uh, family as the captain and the boss in our neighborhood. And, and, but there was an assassination that, that occurred. And that was pretty much pinned on Gotti Sr., correct? Yeah, the, you know, the, Gotti uh, got caught in the, in the middle with some of his guys in a, a drug organization, heroin. Uh, some of his guys got ca- caught on tapes. Uh, Paul Castellano wanted to hear those tapes. They didn't want to turn them over. And Gotti used that to take advantage of, let's hit the boss. He used the excuse that if we don't hit him, he's going to hit us. In my belief, he was never going to hit them. He had a case going on at the time with Roy DeMeo. He had another commission case that everybody got life on. And Paul was involved in that. He didn't have the ability to hit Gotti and them, he didn't have the, uh, he was, there was too much heat on him at the time. So nothing would have been done to, to them. He would have just shelved them. Gotti was smart. He knew that. John, I got to ask you this question about Gotti, because we all watched him. 
And if you watch any of the so-called Godfather movies, Marlon Brando wasn't this, you know, bigger than life guy. But Gotti, <clears throat> he was in the public eye all the time. Teflon Don, he's, he's a, a, a picture of a magazines. Do you think that was harmful for him to be so much in the public eye like that, become such a grandstand? I think that was harmful to him. Yeah, I mean, it's a big mistake. Uh, but I think some of it was intentional, not just because he wanted the attention. He wanted the protection of law enforcement and uh, the media around him constantly, where other, guy, other families couldn't hit him back for him I hitting, uh, being involved in setting up the hit of Paul Castellano. So I think it was, in, it was in, in one aspect, it was intelligent, the way he, he maneuvered the media and law enforcement to actually be the second and third bodyguards for him. And then the other thing is, you know, the notoriety killed him, destroyed him destroyed the, the family, destroyed the mafia. And he, he ended up in prison? He ended up in prison because his uh, underboss, Sammy Gravano, gave him up. Right. You know, Sammy Gravano ended up uh, selling out. You know, he's got an excuse why. Kind of like his son did to me, you know. So when people don't know the history, you have his son who was an informant against me before, and his team of captains, like I just mentioned, and Mikey Scars, D. Leonardo, the whole group of them, along with the Bonanno family, were all testifying and giving information against the mob and me. So, you know, when, when guys aren't loyal to you, uh, you owe them nothing, in my opinion. I mean, people, everybody's going to have their own opinion. But I was in the penitentiaries uh, sitting and fighting a good fight while these guys were all having lunch with the FBI and, and their informants. So, you know. Well, we're going to talk a lot about, uh, you know, how you made the decision to say enough is enough. Right. I'm going to start naming names and... Uh, but in terms of Gotti, uh, yeah, he was sort of bigger than life. Right. I mean, even even up here in Maine, we we would uh, yeah. we, we'd see the news and and uh, what is it with this guy? I mean, he he was right out front. He was glamorous. He was. How did how did you feel about him? I yeah. mean, did you look up to him as a this this is the best uh, of Cosa Nostra uh, that he he lived it. Uh, did you look up to him, uh, John? Oh, as a kid, I definitely looked up to him. I mean, there's things later on that I questioned. Right, yeah. Because you're getting a little, you know, you're older, you're intelligent. Uh, and I grew up with guys like Fat Andy that was very quiet and, you yeah. know, Al Greco who was quiet and, yeah. you know, Handsome Jack and these other guys that were in the mob were, uh, you know, a different type of gangster. They were, you know, low-key and quiet. Some of the Gambino family guys that I grew up with, with you know, the Carlos son, Tommy, very <clears throat> a gentleman, not a tough guy, but a business, but, but gentleman, quiet. Yeah. And John was the opposite. John right. was very flamboyant. And I understood some of it. And some of it was for show. I mean, I, I got to tell you, guys talk bullshit now because everybody can say what they want. But when I was around with John, if he told them, go kiss his shoes, go tie my shoes, go get my car, they all jumped. They weren't gangsters with him. Yeah. They were soft. And he knew they were soft. So he knew how to maneuver them. He knew how to bully him around and, and how to control them all. Yeah. And they were weak. He wasn't in, in a lot of aspects. And, you know, I, I use Sammy as an example. He does a lot of talking now, but he carried the man's, he's carrying an umbrella for another man. He's walking around like a, like a puppy. So yeah. all that nonsense, you're not all about that because you're carrying umbrellas for this guy. Did Gotti ask you to carry his umbrella? No, or? when I was a kid, I looked at him more like a, like a son. You know, he had me in his house, yeah. sleeping in his house. I'd be with them at different events, and when people question that, I was, you know, because you're going to get people who question this. There's videotapes of me picking them up at court. There's videotapes of me coming out of his house. There's videotapes of me at the right. night night. You know, and these are in the era when there is no tapes and there is no cameras. So, you know, yeah. I had a different relationship. He would say, it, you, you know, you're with the regime, meaning you're with the king. Yeah. I, 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 uh, are you about the same age as his son, John A. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the same age as and his you, son. So you folks were, grew up uh, in, the, in, uh, in the same house, sleeping over, and, and, and you get to know him. And later on, you testify against him at a court of law, federal court. Well, state court. I'm testifying against a guy that's an informant. That's the part. It's like what Whitey Bulger did, yes. so people understand. He's a guy that's an informant. Since 1998, he's bringing the FBI with him to go see his father. You, you, there's no business with the FBI. You know, when you're traveling around with them, you're giving information from you. I don't know anything to an informant. So, you know, people don't understand there's a time frame here of when a guy's an informant, when he's running around and he's dropping dimes on me. And me, not just me, the organization. And his answer is, well, I was only ratting on my enemies or people I didn't like. Right, so, right. I mean, ridiculous statements. But the, the part that I try to tell kids is, you got a guy whose father went to do life while he was doing life, he's an older man, he gets stomped on in prison. His son does nothing to that guy that comes home a year later. 
You have a guy, Sammy Gravano, to put your father in prison. He's all over the media. You did nothing to that guy that gave your father life and made him die in prison, choking on a spit with cancer. <clears throat> you got a guy whose best man got killed in front of his children, and you got Gotti Jr. has done nothing. He's not a gangster. He won't even protect his own family, his own father. His own little cousin got shot in the belly by a guy named Vito, and he did nothing. So when people are talking about gangsters, you know, you want to live that life, you've got to be about that life. If you're not about that life for your own father, your own family, your own cousin, your own best man, you're not a gangster. That's why he was an informant. He was weak. John, we know that when, when certain soldiers uh, go to Afghanistan or, or Vietnam, their, their particular occupation, like a Marine forward observer, they have a short life expectancy. So in this world of yours, the life expectancy for you guys, the minute you walk in the door, is not good. It's, it's, I mean, how much? What, what well, you got, <clears throat> again, you got a lot of guys that are faking their way through life. If you want to do what I do, you're going to get hurt. That means you don't just dish it out. You, you, like me, I've been baseball batted several times. I've been stabbed up several times. I've been stabbed in the head, in the stomach, in the arms. I've been shot. You know, you're going to get your beatings because you're going out and you're not picking and choosing your spots. But when you got other guys that are maneuvering in the background and they, they're, 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 they're trying to give a persona like they're out there doing work and they're, they're dangerous guys, 99% of them are, are frauds. You know, you got that 1% that are tough guys that are really out there doing work. You got guys like Sammy, and I'm going to keep using Sammy because everybody knows who he is. The guy shot one guy out of 19. I want people to check the paperwork. You know, this guy's selling himself a dream. You know, he, they got an image for these kids to buy into, and it's bullshit. So it's like, you know, my, my whole idea is back to the kids again, is to explain to the kids, don't buy into this crap. These guys are selling their own stories. John, talk, you mentioned your work. Your work as an enforcer. How many people do you think you, you've been responsible for, for killing? I mean, again, you know, that question's asked to me, and I give different answers depending on, you know, whatever I show, when you're not really giving the audience and the people that are listening uh, facts. When you're shooting people or somebody's shooting people, we don't check each body. You yeah. know, if, and then you got charges of this government when you're killing somebody. I shot a guy in the head, and I'll give you an example, on the Bell Parkway, Interboro Parkway, Ricky Stratton, and I'll say it by name so people know. I had a guy, Larry Cuccarelli, and some of his family members were with me. They were driving with me when I did the work. And the guy died a month later. They didn't charge me with the homicide. I baseball batted another guy, three bikers. I killed him. He was a vegetable. They didn't charge me with that homicide. I'm not uh, a, a, a prosecutor. I don't know why they didn't charge me on some of those. Some of them, they didn't have bodies. I was involved with the good fellas. Uh, Frankie Burke was my good friend, his father, Jimmy, in the movie. Everybody From knows the, the good movie. Fellas, yeah. We hit two guys in Brooklyn. They didn't charge me with those bodies. So it's very hard to say how yeah. many exactly. But you got, you know, when guys are questioning that, I tell them, listen, I'm not a forensic team. I don't stick around. I got guys like Andrew Costelli, he's dead, who shot a couple guys with me. Uh, and Joey Danka, actually, Joey's dead also. We had a problem on 111th Street on Liberty Avenue. And, you know, again, I try to be specific so yeah. people understand that, you know. That you're not full of shit. Yeah. And they happened to be the shooter on this. Angela was. Now, do I believe, at least for sure, I believe one of them's dead. I think the second guy's dead. I'm not getting charged. I'm at the scene. I'm involved in the scene. I got hurt at the scene. But he was the shooter. So do I know for sure these guys died? I didn't stick around. We took off. Uh, we shot some Jamaicans on a, on a robbery. Uh, I don't know how many of those guys got killed. So it's very hard to give that number. I, you know, what number I do give is I was involved in, a, you know, 40-something shootings. So 40? 40. 40-something, 40 yeah. How, how, how did you pay your lawyers? You must have had a, a battery of lawyers, right? I had a ton of lawyers when, when uh, they started informing uh, all the list of some of the guys that gave them more guys. I started hiring attorneys. I kept guys like Richie Raybach, for people who don't know. That was Gotti Sr.'s lawyer. He gave them to me. Uh, so he was working for me. I kept him on payroll for a long time. There was a note, he was getting divorced from his, uh, his wife, Sylvie. There was a bad divorce, and she called me a cash cow in the newspapers. The, 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 know, the, the lawyer's wife? wife? Because she wanted the money that I was giving Richie. Richie hid it. Can I ask you how, what you might pay for, for a retainer on a, on a certain criminal matter? What, what, what I mean, it depends on a, on a good attorney. My yeah. last attorney was Roy Black's office out of Miami. Yeah, sure. I gave him a half a million. Uh, Howard Srednuck was one of my attorneys. What? Half a million retainer I gave him. So, you know... It, it, but I have a team of lawyers. He's just one. I had several others. I had to get attorneys for my family because they were all being taken in. 
So, you know, and I had investigators, I had an attorney in Brazil, uh, uh, Otavio Neves. I gave him a quarter of a million in Brazil. So, you know, I'm going for big money. I went for a couple of million in just in, in lawyers and investigators. Yeah. So when people are talking about, you know, money, you, you, that the money comes in pretty good, but yeah. it's going out pretty good, too. Uh, uh, John, uh, as, as Rob told you, uh, Rob and I had the last interview with F. Lee Bailey before right. he passed away. Great attorney. And, and he, he, Rob great, was great one, of, gentleman. one of, one of Rob, uh, Bailey's best friends was Rob himself. Uh, he wrote a book about the truth about the O.J. Simpson trial, in which his theory, his, which is somewhat convincing, at least to me, is that the Colombian drug cartel uh, wanted to uh, kill these two women, Resnick and, and uh, Nicole Brown, for not paying their debts for cocaine. You mentioned in the book that one of your buddies stole some money from the, from the cartel, the Colombian cartel, it stole some kilos, and they found his head on a spike or something like that. Do you concur with F. Lee Bailey that, that it is at least possible that the, the Colombian cartel might have been involved in, in the uh, so-called O.J. Simpson, Nicole Brown murders? Do, do you? Well, here's what, we, you know, Marsha Clark, I believe, was a prosecutor. Yes, right, that's right? correct, yeah. And, you know, the problem is they wanted the media, she could say what she wants, but she wrote some books, and they made some detrimental mistakes in that trial that people thought I was nuts because I used to follow that trial. I was a big fan of O.J. Simpson, and unfortunately, a, a woman died and a young kid, but... Yes. That glove did not fit him. No matter what they say, the glove didn't fit him. Forget about everything else in that evidence. That glove was supposed to be a glove that was used at that scene of the crime that was dropped there. It didn't even close to fit in his hand. They said some excuse, well, he had arthritis and his head swelled. You could, that glove didn't even fit over his fingers. Forget about the swollen. So it, to me, it's always a major thing. If he did do it, Maybe he had an accomplishment. How come they didn't find out who we did? And then you got the, uh, the officer at the time, I forget his name. He was a, a racist guy. He made Furman. some stupid yeah. Furman. He made some bad comments. Yeah. So there was a lot of evidence there to, to really question that homicide. You, you know, it's supposed to be a, over a shadow of doubt that he did it. And there's no way you could say that knowing that glove didn't fit him. Exactly. And, and, yet, yet, and possibly you had a second suspect there that nobody brought in. So... I've always said no matter what, he might have acted funny, he might have did something, but people do funny things, trust me, because when I was in trouble and I was on the run and I was spending millions of dollars, you know, the juries, they, they, they indict a ham sandwich. You know, because, you know, so <laughs> these, you're getting indicted. So if you're a, a, a guy like O.J. Simpson, you're a black man in America, and, and I hate to pull a race card here because I do a lot of talks for inner cities and I don't like anybody using an excuse for themselves, but he was a, a famous rich black man and L.A. doesn't have a great reputation of prosecuting, I would feel the same way as him. I mean, yeah. you know, so, you know, people are saying it's strange behavior. Well, you can't blame him because of the history in L.A. I'm just going to say to you, F. F. Lee Bailey, wherever you are, buddy, that was one of the best, uh, uh, best uh, the validations of, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Bailey's book uh, that I can think of. Go ahead, Rob. No, no, what I was going to say is... Uh, <laughs> With, with uh, social media now being so prevalent in our lives uh, and people's fascination with organized crime and the mafia as a result of all the movies, the Sopranos and everything, uh, I think you were one of the first, John, to, to really go online to, with podcasts and YouTube. Uh, and then, you, then that, that follows with uh, Sam, uh, with uh, Michael Frances and Gravano and others. And they've also, uh, in the case of Francis and, uh, and Gravana, I'd like you to talk a little bit about them because you know them both. Uh, Francis kind of dismisses you in, in an interview that I see. Like you, you were, you know, he never met you. And then, uh, then you got uh, Gravano who, uh, you know, uh, made his derogatory comments about you. And I know when he first came out of jail, you actually tried to help him. I helped him. I gave him money. Yeah. He did a 40-minute tape about me. Yeah, he had the the stupidity because he's not too bright to say talk that. about him. I gave him three grand. He begged me for money. He had no money. He asked me for help in construction. He asked me for help with Albanians. He asked me for help. You know, you gotta remember these guys never even left the country. You yeah. know, they're neighborhood guys. They're not as bright as everybody thinks. Yeah, and they're not as tough as everybody thinks. Not even close to it. And I'll give you an example of that quickly. Go ahead. Eddie Lino got killed. Sammy did nothing about it. His best friend Frankie Chico got blown up in a car. He did nothing about it. Bobby Borrello got killed. He did nothing about it. 
The Heidel brothers got killed. He did nothing about it. Little Anthony Shorty got killed at Bedrocks. He did nothing about it. I could go on. Where's anybody believing the loyalty to this life? Where's this tough guy? You didn't, you didn't kill nobody back when all the families are killing our guys. Mm -hmm. When they tried to kill John Gotti Sr., where were you? As soon as you got locked up, you talked this nonsense. You didn't like Gotti. You were in there with him. Why didn't you kill him? Mm -hmm. You ain't going to kill Gotti. Stop your talking. These guys run their mouths, but they're not about anything. And no one's challenging them, and they'll never get on a show with me. None of them. Because I'll embarrass them. I'm the only one that diminishes their bullshit. And you've and asked them. Say, you've asked them to. Well, yeah, I've asked them, and they, they, instead they bring on dummies, in, you know, like Bobby Louisi. Yeah. You know, he's an okay guy, but he's a dummy. I said, so yeah, they can put them on a show, and they're like puppets. They put the string, and they can tell them what to do and say, because they're not intelligent enough to dance these guys. I can dance all over these guys, because I know they're not really about anything. So when they're trying to believe and send a message to the people that are in the mob world that, are, that like this genre but don't really understand it, and there's a handful of street guys and people that are not in, actually involved, but they, they do get it, mm -hmm. well, they'll use their titles. Yeah. And I can use titles too. Jimmy Burke wasn't a made guy. He was Irish. But I don't think anybody in that mob world was really telling Jimmy what to do. Mm -hmm. So when these guys are playing that card, or Joe Watts was German, I don't see too many people telling him what to do. Instead, you got guys like John Gotti Jr. who has a title. He ain't a street guy. But then he ratted on Joe when he says he was his enemy. That's why he ratted on him. What kind of ridiculous statements are for these guys? And, and who the fanboys that are, uh, that are buying into this? So I can go with names like Maya Lansky. I right. can go in with Bugsy Siegel. Mm -hmm. I can go, you know, so those, numbers could, those names could continue. These guys throw that title out because they try to bullshit people. And they'll tell you about, oh, I sat with Tony Salerno. I said, no one gives a shit. And I'll say that to them if they got me on a show. I says, okay, tell me when you, tell me about how you put a, a, a hit together. Tell me how you put a robbery together. Tell me where you do, where'd you do those robberies? Mm -hmm. People don't know what went on. It, it, Kamala Harris is a vice president who's, who's a dummy. We know that. Whether you like or don't like is, is besides that. That's Sammy Gravano. She fit the political stage for Joe Biden in America right now. That's why she's there. Only that, and we all know that. Sammy Gravano fit the stage for John Gotti Sr. He needed him. He needed somebody he can boss around, treat like a dummy, tell him to take the fall if he wanted him to take the fall. Not that I believe that's Sammy's version. But if you want to be that guy, then what'd you do to get there? Tell us. Mm -hmm. you, know, right. you, you, you know, for people that don't know, he was in his 20s and he's robbing tires out of the back of a car. This is Gravano. And Gravano. Yeah. Yeah, we'll bring Fats Al in, who's a friend of mine, who's a gangster, who's intelligent. He's away from the life. You got to bring guys in that know the stories, that know what, what the truth is. His name wasn't Sammy the Bull. It started <laughs> off as Sammy the Bullshit. He was going bullshit us. So when he's talking about John Gotti, John Gotti talking about because he's dead. And you're talking about him because his son's weak. That's why he didn't kill you. And his uncles are well, weak because that's why they didn't kill you. And, and if you're a tough guy, you wouldn't be hiding under a rock in Arizona. So I don't know what everybody's so hard to see here. These guys are, are painting an image of themselves and full of shit. But I guarantee you one thing, if John Gotti was here, he would never open his mouth on any TV or anything. Right. He'd be hiding and he'd stay hiding. So there's the difference. In, you you, you want to like John or hate John or, you know, he made some mistakes, but he was a gangster. John, some of your comments, uh, uh, precisely why my director here at the TV uh, station, Tom Andel, said we ought to have some security out there. I swear to God. Um, have, have you heard the name, or do you know Gianni Russo, who played Carlo in the movie Godfather? Do you know him personally? Yeah, yeah. I don't know him personally, <clears throat> but we, we've talked on uh, social media. I'll, I'll bet. Now, he has been interviewed, and because of your very high position in this family, among the highest that, that anybody could imagine. He was giving, without any hesitation, uh, opinions on various things that have happened in the country. And so I'm going to give you some true or false questions, but you can answer true or false. You can say, I don't want to decline. For example, the first question I want to ask you, the assassination of John F. Kennedy was orchestrated or involved the mob? True or false? True. Jeez, okay. Jack Ruby, true or false, Jack Ruby, was hired by the mob to kill Lee, Lee Harvey Oswald. True. <laughs> Lee Harvey, ready for this one? Lee Harvey Oswald was not the lone assassin, as the Warren Commission said he was. True, he couldn't even make that shot, besides a miracle bullet, but go ahead. Okay, the final one. It's the final one. Um, Frank Sinatra, his greatest protection as a human being, 
actually came from the mob. True. Thank you. And the people that question uh, 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 Russo yeah. is, uh, you know, again, he's a smart guy. He jokes and he doesn't answer them and he shouldn't answer them. Because yeah. these are idiots that don't even know what true, what facts, or they, they don't right. even understand it. And especially when you're playing at this level that we're talking about here. I know a sniper that teaches guys in, in our armed forces to snipe. So I know exactly we have these discussions. There's only a handful of people that could have made that shot. And on those angles, it wasn't happening. So, you know, you remember the technology back then, what they knew back then and what they know now and the right. cover-ups. So, you know, again, it, 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 some of the people that talk, they talk without any knowledge. And, and you, you can't stop that, especially in this, in this day and age. Did you watch the movie uh, The Irishman? Sure. Yeah. Jimmy Hoffa. I, I, yeah, I did. Tell I, me what your thoughts yeah, were. I was, I, I, Jimmy Hoffa was going to be my next one. Go ahead, buddy. I watch. No. I had, uh, you know, I, on my show, for people that don't know, I have a podcast, and yes. I had Jimmy Hoffa's driver on. Okay. So he was involved with Maya Lansky. He was an ex-fighter. He lives in Canada. He's 87 years old. A legitimate guy. Yep. All the fellow gentlemen. Very intelligent, if you listen to him talk on my show, on my podcast. And uh, guys that, you know, again, when you're talking about to this level, and you have guys that were firsthand, guys that were driving Vito, and this guy's driving Vito Genovese around, he's driving, he loved Vito Genovese, he said he was a gentleman, act like an old uh, grandpa, he used to yell at Jimmy Hoffa, for, always abusing him, you know, leave the kid alone, he's a nice kid. So, you know, these situations are firsthand information. Yeah. When people are questioning guys on firsthand information with no knowledge, yeah. Yeah. Talk a little bit about your, I don't know how much more time we have, but. This is kind of flying by, uh, David, <laughs> but uh, you served time in prison. How many years did you serve in prison? I served, you know, in the, the, the media. If you listen to the media, my last case has had six years. I did uh, ten and a half on the last case. Uh, prior to that, I did three and a half a gun cases, about 18 years. 18, 18 years, years in prison. 18 years of your life, and you're yeah. 60 years old. Yeah. And you're in all over, all over the, all over the United States. How many different prisons are uh, in Brazil? Again, yeah, I, I got a good Brazil. memory. Yeah. I went to yeah. Bongo II in Brazil, Capo Grande in Brazil, and uh, uh, Ari Franco in Brazil, which not an advocate group was ever in that, those jails. So, uh, Capo Grande was a little soft. What did you say? Like, not an advocate group has ever been with? in, in uh, Ari Franco or up to the, when I was there. I don't know now. Me the meaning last, what? Meaning. The conditions are horrendous. Deplorable. L like what? I, 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 I want to hear, hear some details. Uh, you, you go to the bathroom in a hole. You have uh, mice, rats all over. You have one light bulb. And because of the grid, the electric grid, it goes out. So you're in, in the dark, you know, what, what three, kind four of days a week. Horrible food. Rice and beans in big containers full of piss, shit, uh, rats, uh, bugs. Um, you're, you're, you're a third world country where you have favelas that are incredibly bad. People oh, yeah. know that. Yeah. So you're not going to go on a step up from the favelas or everybody wants to go to jail. So, you know, you're going to step down. <laughs> they see how bad the Jesus. favelas are. Yeah. So, you know, you're talking about riots, murder, water that comes up to the top. Uh, you have piping that's tripping shit in water. You're so below uh, terrain. Uh, you have killings that go rampant. We have guns in there. We have machetes. We have knives. So it's how do you sleep a, at night, John? You get you get it sleep. rains inside because half the half the fencing because you have catwalks above us. You don't sleep at night. How you, long would you stay in one of these places? I stayed there two years and two uh, years. Uh, seven months. And every minute is horrible. Horrible. We just did a movie on it about Klaus's life story. He's the boss of Denmark. It was a four part series and him and guys from London, guys who were in jails with me from Italy, from Turkey, from Spain. Uh, we're all friends still, and you know they got involved a little bit on the on the uh, movie and how do you we talked about. John, how do you survive? How do you survive something such like conditions? that? I, know I mean, violence. I got all my teeth knocked out when I was there. Just part of it. If you're going to be in the mix, you're going to get hurt. I mean, it's just part of it. So when guys, you know, you got a lot of guys talking about, you know, guy hit you or guy just that's part of the life. And you're going to get it, you're John. Hurt. You're going to get suckered. You're going to get. You are five eight. You're my height. You're not a, a big... I thought I was taller than you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was, too. <laughs> See, he was wearing heels. <laughs> John, how do, how do you establish yourself... Right off the bat, with these giant dudes that we see, yeah. how do you? What do you have to? You have to knock a few guys out. Got to be aggressive. I mean, you know, aggression's everything. You, if you hear some of the people that talk, they say oh, he's very aggressive. I mean, I'm listen. I'm the same guy, but I'm laid back. I got a different life, but in that life, you got to be aggressive. If you're in that life, you want to survive and you want to be uh, in. If you want to be. You don't. You have no choice. If you're in those jails. You got to be aggressive. You're not going to intimidate anybody by the way you look. You know, I'm not six five, 
So it's not going to happen. You have to be aggressive. So what do you have to show. do? Like take somebody out right off the bat? Well, you don't have. I mean, when an incident happens, uh, you got to you got to be aggressive. Yeah, you got to hurt them. You got to kill them. You got to stab them up, uh, and that's just part of it. You know, if somebody shies away from that, you're not going to make it through those jails. I had guys like Klaus, who was six five, uh, Justin Beck in in the, the UK with me, who was six seven. These guys could tell the stories for me. I don't have to tell them. They were with me. They know how I act. Jesus. <laughs> It's incredible. Well, I got. I want to ask another. I want to ask another. Yeah, let, me, let me just jump no, in ahead. though. At go what ahead. point, you you come back? You're out of jail. You're out, you're out, you've, you've done your probation. At what point did you say, okay? And look, what, do you have any regrets? First of all, what you did, and second, do you miss the life that you had, being part of organized crime? Any regrets? Yeah, you know, somebody asked me a regret on a show. I said something about I don't regret it. They're misunderstanding what I'm saying. I can't regret my whole life because mm -hmm. it's not possible. Right. Am I sorry for a lot of things and my choices? Of course I am. Did I reach out to people and victims of mine, whether they were killed or hurt by me? Yeah. Um, I can't change that. It was, it was the road I took, whether I like it or not. The past is the past. I got to leave it there. I can only do the right thing going forward. And that's what I try to do. I work yeah. with a lot of kids. I work with a lot of organizations. Yeah. I try to be very upfront and, and precise on the way I talk. Yep. Uh, factual, you know, dates, times, addresses like I just gave. Right. Money that I had, bank accounts. I, I showed everything over the years. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, people say, well, he's embellishing, he's exaggerating. Not just me. They say it about other people. They say it about Russo. When people don't understand and they live in a little bubble, like I said, most of these guys never left their neighborhood. We're going to 30 countries, 40 countries. We're involved in a different level that these guys can't even comprehend. And then you have guys, like I said, where the people know, people know I don't really particularly care about the Gotti kid, but they know I like the father. Mm -hmm. So if there's loyalty in that life, I gotta show people, then why didn't you do anything about people hurting you? Not as a gangster, just as a son to a father. Right. Right. So if Sammy was so worried about that, he wouldn't be, living in Arizona. He'd be here in Brooklyn if he wasn't worried about that, excuse me. He'd live where he loves it. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're telling stories and nobody's questioning them. That's why these guys want me on TV. But the second part of your question was what? If I got regrets, I do. Yeah, regrets you do, uh, but if do, you you miss a, do you miss yeah, that and life, Yeah, and the other thing, and you know what, and I'm honest to the kids too, and I have to be honest, of course I miss it. Okay. I miss the power, I miss the money, right. I had tons of money, I miss it. But it isn't worth it. There's right. two different things. Exactly. It's not worth it. The suffering that we don't talk about today, we haven't talked about the health, mental issues, because the physical I could take. How about the PTSD? Yeah. How about the, the crying? Because I, I'm like everybody else. I'm a human. I shed tears. I miss my kids growing up. Sure. I miss them when they were sick in hospital. I miss their graduations. I miss their, you know, when they were getting engaged. or you know, One son just got engaged. I miss a lot of things. Family members of mine passed away. Uh, cousins were killed on the street. So, I, you know, all that in consideration, it's not worth it. You gotta be a fucking dummy to think that's worth this life. And I show you the treachery, no one's loyal to me. They stole my money while I was in prison. They testified against me. My family members were giving me up. My friends were giving me up. My friends that I helped weren't loyal back to me. They told me to go fuck myself. You have all the mobsters, I just named them all. Besides all the bosses I can name from everybody in different, from Ralph Natale in, in Philly and, Gas Pipe and the Lucchese family, Al, uh, uh, the, the boss of uh, the Lucchese family prior to that, mm -hmm. that, that, that uh, went bad. So you got guys in every family, Joe Messina wearing a wire. So, you, you know, when people are saying, what are you talking about? Whitey Bulger here in Boston, Chucky Porter in Pittsburgh. What? Where's the it's treachery? It's everybody's every man for themselves. <clears throat> Anybody believes any different for these kids that are selling a dream to these kids, they need to be honest to them. So them, the notion that the mafia was this family and, and, and the mafia came before their own personal family. Well, what idiot would say that you have a, 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 an intelligent son? I, I don't yeah. want to bring him on. He goes to school, good looking, <laughs> Maybe. intelligent. You're telling me if somebody walks in here with a gun, you're going to protect me first before right. your son? Right. What idiot's going to buy into that? Right. So the day they prick their finger, they start lying. Okay. So, you know, who, who's start lying. Is that what you just said? Yeah, see, yeah. Uh, so, John, go ahead. you wrote, you know, just because it's right in line with what sure. you're saying. Besides the money, adrenaline rushes were one of the many things I lived for. I loved to fight. Whether it was the cartel, 
the mafia, or anyone else, the number of guys fighting against me never bothered me. I knew that I'd be smarter, tougher, crazier. The adrenaline rush is something, I run senior track, and I run the 100 meter dash, and people say, why do you do this? Because the adrenaline rush lasts for a couple hours, especially if I win. So, were you actually doing any of those drugs that you were involved selling, or were you just basically alcohol and the adrenaline rush? Were you doing some of those I, drugs? I mean, we, people ask me, oh, he was, you know, you hear dumb stories from guys, oh, he was right. a drug. I, I was no drug, ever. Did I socialize ever and, and fuck around a little bit with coke? Yeah, of course I did. Yeah. Was I a partier? Never. I never lost control of myself with any kind of alcohol. You, if you lost control, I was a money guy. You know, you don't make money and you don't last in this life if you're right. going to be a, a if you're going to be a drug user. I mean, there's guys that use it and it takes over. Guys that drink, they drink too much. It takes right. over. I wasn't one of those guys ever. I was too much into athleticism and money. So you know, I never lost control on any of that. No. I mean, did I ever try it? Yeah. Yeah. I play around here and there with a girl. Yeah, that'd be a lie if I said it. But. Never to any extent of any kind of problem. I didn't do it every day. I do it once a month. I do it sometimes once a week, like I would drink alcohol. You drink every day? No. You know, I drink it. Sometimes I don't drink for two months. Sometimes I drink three days in a row. But I never let anything control me like that. And your children, are they all pretty much grown up now? I have one son in prison. Uh, he's, he's in prison? One son in prison. I got two sons. Well, what, 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 well. what, can I ask what he's there for? Yeah, same as what I did. It was shooting. Uh, oh, really? Shooting and uh, gun possession, and again, he didn't know the guy he shot. Actually, the guy came to a house that was bothering the owner of the house that used to live in the same house. My son happened to be there, and he came back and forth, threatened him. He said he was going to shoot him. He came back with his hand under his shirt with a gun. When he stepped up, my son started shooting him. How long? How long will he be there? He gets. Uh, he's been in about uh, six years. He was. Uh, he gets out, I believe, next year, hopefully. Okay. And and so you, you were not able to talk him out, out of what you had been, been involved you know, in? The, you know, the funny thing is, I, you know, at the time, I said, why don't you just go upstairs? Why did you stay out? And he said, would you go upstairs? That was his answer, like most kids would say to me. And I go, yeah, actually, I wouldn't. That's why I ruined my life. Yeah. So, but after he shot this gangster, because the kid's a gangster, gang member, gangster, yeah, right. said, the first thing he did was rat on my son. So, you know, this goes back to the same thing. And I told my son, well, now you're in prison. He's on the beach. Mm -hmm. Right. So he says, so tell me how that worked out for you. And he sees it now. Yes. Because I told him, this is what's going to happen. And, and in everything I told him, he sees now. You know, unfortunately, it's not too late for him. I mean, he wastes a big part of his life. He's a kid. You know, he's not that old. He's 32 years old. You, you know, you're seven years in prison, eight years in prison is a lot of wasted time. Mm -hmm. So what I'm telling these kids is, you know, you can have the ego I used to have and ruin your life, or just keep it moving. And if you really want to fight and show how tough you are, get in the ring. Go make it do it for money. Talk, talk about uh, what you're doing now, John, with kids. And you, I know you, you're, you're invited to high schools. and I travel around the world. I yep. mean, it depends on where I'm at. I've been in Kosovo. Uh, I was a guest with the prime, ex-prime minister who I... I have high regard for him. He's a war hero uh, with the Serbian uh, Kosovo War. Um, I talk to kids in, in my country. I do one on ones. I talk to family members. And you went to Switzerland? I went to Switzerland. I, I, they did some articles in Switzerland on me, uh, talking to gangs of kids that really you don't have too much violence in Switzerland. But on occasion, they had violence in Switzerland where they were stabbing each other. And I, I went there. I did a speaking uh, engagement. Um, I get involved in second chance programs. I was involved in speaking in Winslow, Camden County. I did three bids there with inner city kids. I go to Brownsville with a friend of mine, Dan. Hello, Dan, by the way. He's got two kids that were killed on the street. He's got one in prison, a black gentleman. We talk about uh, keeping uh, race and religion uh, out of the streets uh, and get back to when kids are all playing with each other in the streets and no one cares what color you are. Everybody's laughing and smiling. They're being taught hate, and we try to t talk about uh, unity, not division. So I do that. I do a lot of talks at colleges. Uh, Chief Little, you speak uh, at colleges. County. I spoke at uh, probably about seven different colleges. So before now, you on a speak, basis. John, and I'm getting to your question, before you are introduced, do people like get to watch a, a movie about you or a story? I mean, do, do they just get up and say, this guy used to be a bad guy and now he's a good guy? I mean, don't these people have to, I mean, Rob and I researched you and read this book and know about you.
But do they know your background when you first start to speak to these people? I, I mean, I went to Newark High School yes. uh, about four years ago, I believe, and it was about three, 400 students in the auditorium. When I stepped in, the, the principal originally wasn't gonna let me speak because prior to me, the other principal was killed by mob, by a mob. So I said to him, listen, let me just go up for a couple of minutes. There was another guy that introduced me, he was also a, a, a black guy, nice guy, but he wasn't a street guy, he was more of a white collar guy. And uh, I says, if you don't like what I'm saying, stop me. Just give me a thing and I'll cut it after five minutes. And he let me run for about 40 minutes. Hmm. Because I went in and I said, basically, they gave me a small introduction. Sometimes they know me. I did talks at mob museums and, you know, different uh, juvenile centers. And right. so I've been around the, the, the block a little bit talking to troubled kids. But on this occasion, they introduced me and I start off with, uh, you're sitting here now. And then tomorrow you could be me going to college, just like Teddy is gonna go to college. And there's a percentage of you guys, whether you know it or not, are gonna have drug problems, you're gonna go to jail for different things. And I says, just, you gotta say to yourselves, cause you're gonna sit there and say what I said in high school, ain't gonna be me. We all said that ain't gonna be me. But some of you, it is gonna be you. And some of you is unfortunately gonna lose your life in the next couple of years. I said, I'm just trying to lower those numbers. I'm not gonna get all yous to listen to me. But I said, if I tell you about all the killings I did and all the shootings I did, all the years in jail I did, and now they're listening. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. now you, you capture what they understand. Today I told you I wanted to get a coffee at Dunkin' Donuts, two young kids. You know, yeah. they think the image is, and they're probably nice kids. They got their pants off their ass, they're wearing a hoodie, it's 90 degrees out. So it's not because they're cold. Yeah. And I walk in and they want to be gangster, they think that's the cool look. And they're hopping when they're walking and I smile. Usually I bother and I'll say something, I'll give them a card. Yeah. And I'll tell them, if you want to learn about being a gangster, yeah, call me. <laughs> Come here. Because I, you know, I know they're nice kids, they're just lost. They don't know, they think it's cool. You know, yeah. they, the little girlfriends probably think it's cool. Yeah. And it's not. You know, that's not the image. I have a friend, Paulie, and I just came home in Boston. I was with him last night. He did 27 years. He met me when he was 22 years old in prison or about that. And he's 45 now. So he did a couple of years prior to meeting me and then he went back in. And while he's in prison, so people know, he was a regular kid and this is what happens in jail. He had a problem, somebody wanted to hurt him bad and he ended up stabbing him up bad, quote, another 10 years. Yeah. And he did probably seven or 10 years in solitary confinement. That's the reality of the kids that I run in today. I would like them to see him because that was him maybe, yeah. you know, years ago. The poor bastard lost his life and he's lucky he's home at all to mm -hmm. enjoy it now. But now, think about that man that did 27 years. If anybody disrespects him in any way, any way, he's got to eat it. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't eat it, he's going to end up behind bars right. the rest of his life. You say, you say, so I'm telling your, these kids I want to stop before that in happens. Your, in your book, in, in, in your interviews, you say, you, you got to learn to walk away. You got to learn to walk away, because, but most of the time, you didn't walk away. I didn't walk away, so I'm paying for it. <laughs> yeah, how many idiots write me on my uh, on my social media? Right, right, I got right. people that work for me on social media, right? right. Because it's too much of a big. Uh, I got a big platform now in every aspect, right. so it's not going to be me. But they'll send me the messages sometimes, and then, you know I abused the guy the other day. He's he's on social media with his baby on his lap, five six year old boy, yeah. and he's writing me like an imbecile. So I I direct message him, and you know basically I tell him you're a fucking idiot, a clown. And uh, what kind of example to your son that you're so stupid you put a picture up with your son on your lap and you're talking like that? Yeah. Right. And the next day he erased it. So, you know, maybe sometimes you reach some of them. Uh, a, John, um, I want to tell the audience, folks, if you go to Las Vegas, well, the second or third biggest attraction out there is the so-called Mob Museum. It is absolutely fascinating. And it talks about the legitimate aspect, the illegitimate, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's, it's right there. John, have you been to that museum by any chance? I was a guest speaker at the museum, and <laughs> yeah. Goodman is the attorney that was... Why am I not surprised? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he was the mayor at one time. Yes. He's involved with the, you know, the museum. My author, uh, George Anastasia, wrote Gotti's Rules, right. also wrote a book with him about the mob and about his... Uh, as an attorney for the mob and as a mayor in, in Vegas. So, yeah, I, so, I know. And, I know. So, uh, Guardi's Rules, by the way, you said it was a bestseller. Yeah. yeah, and you've got several books. But at that museum, so if people go to that museum, I'm gonna tell you, it's fascinating. You spend several hours there. It's what, one of the best things I've ever been right. to. I agree. You, it's actually a beautiful museum. Yeah. Yes. No, it's not a dump. It's, no, it's, no, 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 no. This is, man, folks, you, I got very, very, yeah. very classy. 
So John, if somebody goes there, they're going to see references to you in, on several aspects of that museum. Yeah. You're, you're all over that place, yeah. basically. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. I mean, because they do a lot with the Gambino family and, and, and the hearings before Congress and all that sort of stuff. Did you ever testify before, like a subcommittee or something? No, 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 no. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> but everything else, everything else. Yeah, I've been involved. Uh, Rob, go that. ahead. We got a couple of minutes left. We got a couple of minutes. I mean, John, talk a little bit about your platform uh, yeah. and your social media, where people can, who are interested in knowing yeah. more about you and your message, uh, where they can find you. Sure. Uh, they can find me if you plug me in, just my name on YouTube. You'll find me in different shows. But one of them is the Mob, the Mafia, and the Man. Yeah. I do a show with uh, an ex-corrupt cop, uh, Mike Dowd, that changed his life. A corrupt he did 15 cop. Years in 15 years in prison. Yeah. He was from the 7-5. Uh, there's a documentary out about him also. Uh, we do a, a, a thing and we hit every subject politically. There is from uh, gay rights to uh, neurosurgeon, who's a, a very good friend of mine. I had him on the show to yeah. politicians I've had on the show to ball players from the New York Giants, uh, from uh, congressmen I'm going to have on shortly. So if I have a very different aspect to gangsters. Uh, I'm on my platform on Instagram is True John Elite. Uh, that's... Uh, I don't know how many, I got a pretty big following there. Um, I've done shows on Netflix, uh, Fear City, Fear I got City a new one coming out. Fear City was a classic. Yeah, I have one Fear, Fear Europe, City is just running out. right now, folks, on, on, on uh, Netflix. On Netflix. And John, I'm going to close by saying this. In your books, in your life, in your life history, if you sat down with a Netflix producer for like three hours, they would have at least... 15 series, the stuff in the, the prisons, the stuff going oh, to yeah. Swiss. I mean, your life is quite incredible for someone that just literally hit the lowest of the low, the rock bottom of taking people's lives. And you certainly have, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 you've pulled yourself up and, and you're encouraging people to live, uh, li live a normal life, basically, right? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, hope, I, I hope I'm helping and encouraging some kids. I mean, you know, I had a bad life, and you know, unfortunately, like I said, I can't change it, but I can only move forward, try to do the right, right thing. Exactly. Hopefully, I reach some of these kids. A lot of parents reach out to me about their sons and daughters. Hopefully, I help them. I just had a 13-year-old girl on my show with a mom that was stabbed up. Another girl tried to kill her, and, and uh, innocent girl. The other girl was a gang member. So I try to reach out. I have a lot of guys from the street, uh, from my neighborhoods, inner city kids, black, Spanish. I have a kid that, a uh, real good kid out of South Side of Chicago. Or Bugatti, that uh, he's a, a rapper that I'm involved with. I, you know, I, I really push his message because he's a positive kid. So there's a lot of young positive kids from our neighborhoods, from the hoods that do the right thing. And people want to reach out to me, JohnElite.com, on my website if I can help them or their family. You also went by the name of John Aletto. Yeah. yeah, when I was on a run and one of the times prior to that, I had a hook in DMV, and they made a new license for me because I was in trouble with something else. And uh, you know, back in those days, you could. You John, one that. final question. Do you ever worry about your life? Yeah. yeah, yeah this is going to be a quick answer, but I, I Just got if it. one of my girlfriends tried to come kill me, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't worry about it. I, I just move around life. Listen, yeah. you, you know, life. I, I don't understand some of the people that walk around with a mask and everything. I get it. You know, they're afraid, but that's not living. You know, yeah. you got to live. I live. I, I stay in my neighborhoods. John, thank you so much. I can't thank you enough for being up here. Rob, thanks for putting this together. All right, buddy. And folks, thanks for watching the Dairy Run Show.